Here at Cork and Fizz, I'm all about helping you discover new wines. Yes, I know it's easy to just continue to buy your favorite bottle, but I have to tell you, you're missing out. Did you know there are over 10,000 different grape varieties and over 65,000 wine producers worldwide? Trust me, there are so many more delicious wines out there for you to try, and your next favorite bottle is just waiting for you to find it. In an effort to encourage you to try something new, I'm bringing back my free summer wine challenge. That's right, it's free. Head to the link in my show notes, corkandfizz.com slash summer wine challenge to sign up. This challenge will last six weeks, and during that time, all I ask is that you try six new wines and fill out a simple tasting form on my website for each one. I'll also be sending you exclusive weekly emails with recommendations for regions and wines to explore. Plus, you'll have access to not one, but two free live virtual tastings where you get to learn about and taste wine with me and fellow challenge goers. If you successfully taste and record six new wines in the six weeks, you'll receive a class pass, which gives you access to a virtual tasting party of your choosing with my tasting club, The Court Crew. Plus, everyone who completes the challenge will be entered to win a free one-year membership to The Court Crew, with one lucky winner being chosen at the end of July. We start June 19th, but you can sign up any time between now and before the challenge ends on July 30th. Head to the link in my show notes to join me. Oh, and did I mention it's free? Interested in learning about wine, but not sure where to start? you're in the right place. Welcome to the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. I'm your host, Haley Bullman, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm a wine enthusiast turned wine educator and founder of the Seattle-based wine tasting business, Cork and Fizz. It is my goal to build your confidence in wine by making it approachable and lots of fun. You can expect to learn everything from how to describe your favorite wine to what to pair with dinner tonight and so much more. Whether you're a casual wine sipper or a total cork dork like myself, this podcast is for you. So grab yourself a glass and let's dive in. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. If you're a regular listener, if you're new here, hi, so glad to have you. Today, we are going to be talking about Santa Barbara wine country. Now, I'm going to do this from a like travel angle of this. So I visited Santa Barbara, I want to say last year in February, and I planned the whole trip myself. Obviously, I got advice from other folks, but I thought this would be really beneficial to kind of talk about the wineries we visited, some restaurants, where we stayed, kind of what I thought about the time that we visited, and just kind of give you a little bit of the rundown in case you want to take a trip to Santa Barbara yourself. Now, I say all this, I also have a full West Coast wine travel guide. It is a free guide that you can download. I'll put the link in the show notes. It includes information on traveling to Santa Barbara, Napa and Sonoma, Willamette Valley, Lake Chelan, and Walla Walla, all here on the West Coast of the U.S. So if you want to check that out, go to the show notes and find the link to download that. Otherwise, let's get into Santa Barbara. Now, before we talk about visiting Santa Barbara, I feel like it always helps to kind of like, let's just station ourselves there. <laughs> let's just give ourselves a little little bit of the basics, right? So Santa Barbara is a very unique wine region, and that is a long transverse valley. It is actually the longest transverse valley found on the western Pacific coast, anywhere between Alaska to South America. It is the longest one. And what transverse means, if you're not sure what that means, it means that the valley goes from east to west. Most commonly, you're going to find valleys that go north to south, right? Because they go along with the mountain ranges. The thing is, there are two mountain ranges in Santa Barbara that run east to west, leaving us with the little sandwiched valley in the middle, which is Santa Barbara wine country, Santa Barbara wine country. There's also a city. Don't get those confused. <laughs> so what this does is it creates really 
perfect climate conditions for world-class cool climate wines. How do we get that cool weather? This is due to the Coriolis effect. This is where cool winds from the western opening to the Pacific Ocean act as a funnel, pushing breezes and fog east through the valley. This causes it to be one of the coolest regions, the coolest grape growing regions in California. The average temperatures peak to around 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 20 to 27 degrees Celsius. And they drop to around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 10 degrees Celsius at night. So you can see a 20 to 30 degree temperature drop. There are a couple warm pockets as well, which allows this region to be quite diverse in the type of wine that it makes. Just a quick reminder, if you are not on my mailing list yet, what are you waiting for? I would love for you to join. When you do, you'll get a free shopping guide that has 15 of my favorite wines under $15. Head to corkandfizz.com, scroll down to the bottom, and there'll be a little section where you can join the mailing list. I send out a weekly newsletter filled with wine tips, recommendations, special offers, and so much more. Now, let's get back to the show. Now, in terms of subregions, again, I like to always be able to picture the region a little bit because if somebody just says Santa Barbara wine country, here's the thing. There are actually, I think there are four AVAs in the Santa Barbara wine country, and they're also separate from the city of Santa Barbara, okay? So keep in mind, there is the city of Santa Barbara, and you will find some urban tasting rooms there, but that is different than Santa Barbara wine country. Santa Barbara Wine Country is made up of two large AVAs or two valleys. So in the north, you're going to have a Santa Maria Valley. And then just below that, you're going to have Santa Ynez Valley. And then within Santa Ynez Valley, there are three more AVAs. So I guess there are five of them. My bad. So within Santa Ynez, there is the Santa Rita Hills, Ballard Canyon, and Happy Canyon. I'm going to put a link to a really great, just super simple map from Wine Folly on Santa Barbara, so you can picture this. But again, Santa Maria Valley is towards the top of the Santa Barbara wine country, and then just below it is the Santa Ynez Valley, and then going west to east, there's Santa Rita Hills, Ballard Canyon, and Happy Canyon within the Santa Ynez Valley. So if we were going to talk just a little bit about each of these regions, I think it helps to do a little, little deep dive. Santa Maria Valley, that's our big one in the north. This is the region's first AVA. It was established in 1981. It has one of the longest growing seasons in California. Here you're going to find a lot of Chardonnay, a lot of Pinot Noir, but you will also find some Northern Rhone style Syrah, meaning it's going to be higher acidity, more mineral, a little bit earthier, not quite as that like big fruit bomb that you see a lot of Syrahs in California being like. Now moving down to San Inez Valley, this is the largest AVA in the region. It is 77,000 acres planted over 60, that's six zero, 60 different varieties and spanning over 30 miles east to west. There are two townships in San Inez County that are worth calling out. You have Solvang and Los Olivos. Solvang was actually founded by the Danish in 1911. And when you visit there and you go, you'll, you'll know it's very obvious based off all the windmills and the half-timbered buildings. It is super, super cute. We actually stayed when my husband and I went down to Santa Barbara. We stayed in Solvang. So we got to see it's got lots of cute little shops. I highly recommend taking some time to just kind of like walk around downtown. Now, in terms of Los Olivos, they are not too far from Solvang. And they have a very like porch culture, laid back, hang out with your neighbors, just sit around and chat like the old days kind of vibe. So both of them are definitely worth visiting beyond just these wine regions that we're going to talk about. Now in San Inez, right? So we're within the San Inez Valley. Furthest west is going to be a region called Santa Rita Hills. I think this place makes the best Pinot Noir in all of California. Like it is California's version of Burgundy. Then moving into the center, you have Ballard Canyon. I know less about this region, but apparently they're really great at making mouthwatering Syrah. So about 50% of the region is devoted to Syrah. And it's the only AVA in the USA devoted to this grape. There's another 30% of plantings that go to other Rhone varieties, such as Grenache, Viognier, and Roussan. Like I said, it's in the middle of the San Ynez Valley. It has a high diurnal shift, even more than the average. So remember I said it was like 70 to 80 drops to 50. In Ballard Canyon, you can see a drop from 90 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And again, that Syrah that they make is very much more in that French style rather than like the big fruit bombs um, that you can see from California. Finally, on the eastern edge of the Santa Ynez Valley, you have Happy Canyon. Happy Canyon is the warmest area in Santa Barbara wine country. The name of it is actually quite fun. It was named during Prohibition by folks who would take a trip up Happy Canyon because <laughs> they grew grapes and made wine. Probably, you know, they made wine for the churches, of course. That's what you did in Prohibition, right? They have low yields, really ripe, late ripening grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit Bordeaux, and Cabernet Franc here. So if you get a Cabernet Sauvignon from Santa Barbara, it is very likely that it came from Happy Canyon. They also get things like Syrah and Grenache, grapes that require a lot of heat, will be in this area. I've got, had very good Petit Bordeaux from Happy Canyon as well. Now, why do I love Santa Barbara so much? Why, you know, if I, I've only done two of these types of episodes where I highlight a region and kind of talk about traveling there. The first one was Walla Walla, and we all know I'm obsessed with Walla Walla, okay? So I won't bug you with it. <laughs> but Santa Barbara, honestly, is like a close second to my favorite wine regions here in the U.S. One of the reasons, it is not pretentious in the slightest. It is just a bunch of wine lovers making wine that they want to share with other people who love wine. It is less expensive, both like in terms of like going yourself and, and trying wine and buying wine, but also for the winemakers. They don't have to pay as much for the grapes there. And so this way they get to have a little bit more variety. They get to experiment. They get to try things. And there are lots of smaller wineries because they can afford to do things on a small scale. They have amazing food here. So many of the restaurants are so, so delicious. I mean, there's something about like a wine region can have great wine, but then if it doesn't have really good restaurants and food, you're like, ah, I'd rather just buy the wine and stay home, you know? But here you're going to want to visit to have this food. And then, oh my God, it's freaking beautiful here. Like Walla Walla gives like West, uh, what do I want to say? Like out West kind of chill cowboy kind of vibes, you know, and you've got the mountains in the background, which are beautiful. But Santa Barbara is close to the ocean. <laughs> like, come on. It's also California. So like, even if you visit in February, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, that's when I visited, it was still like sunny and beautiful. And it was great. Okay. Let's go over a few little kind of travel basics and some of my tips. First, how do you get to Santa Barbara? So the most direct option is to fly into the Santa Barbara airport. This is SBA, or you can fly into the Santa Maria airport, SMX. My tip is to fly into SBA. If you're coming from not the West Coast, you may have to do a layover, but I think it's worth it. It, it gets you really close. And then you drive your rental car, so you get a rental car from SBA, and you drive that along the 101 into wine country. It is, oh, it's so gorgeous. I just, I'm obsessed with like looking at the water. <laughs> it's so pretty. Uh, just a quick note here. You'll likely have to update your route when using navigation. If you're driving from the airport to wherever you're going in wine country, the 101 isn't always the fastest option, but it is the prettiest and it's worth it. You can also fly into LAX, but it's a two plus hour drive from there. You can also take the train from LA, Orange County, or San Diego. Okay, now you've gotten to Santa Barbara. How do you get around? You will definitely need a rental car or a driver to get around Santa Barbara wine country. It spans across multiple towns, including Solvang, Los Olivos, San Ynez, Los Alamos, and more. We actually rented a Tesla. It was not much more expensive than a gas car, um, which was really nice because the hotel we stayed at and the one that I'm recommending um, later had a Tesla charger. So we never had to pay for gas. It was it was kind of perfect. It was really, really nice. Highly recommend. And Uber is an option. So if you just want to, but the problem is that like even just getting from the airport to wherever you're going is a pretty long drive. So it's going to be expensive. So just keep that in mind. But some of the other regions I talk about, like Walla Walla, for example, doesn't have Uber really. There's not a lot of options. So at least this place does have that. But I would recommend either hiring a driver ahead of time. There are a lot of tour guides around that area or getting that rental car. Now, where to stay? There are so many options. I'm just going to highlight two of them. I've only actually personally stayed at one, but this other one, I did a lot of research and it seemed like it was coming back as a great option. And I think Somebody else that I follow, I think Lexi's Wine List, I think she stayed at the Ballard Inn, so I threw this on there as an option. But the place I stayed at was called Hotel Yanez. It's an old motel that they redid, and so it was a motel style, so you get to your room by just being outside, and then you walk into your door. 
but it used to be this big parking lot in the middle and they redid it and it is this beautiful like communal like hangout space with these big trees and fire pits and a bocce ball court and it was just really really nice and they have free hot breakfast they had these cute little they're still doing them um they're delicious it was these cute little quiches little baby quiches oh they were delicious and they also have a Tesla charger. So highly recommend. They're super friendly. The rooms are comfortable. And it was just like a cool place. I remember one of the nights we were waiting to go out to dinner and we were sitting out by the fire. They have blankets for the fire because they know it gets cool in the evening. Um, we were sitting out there with a blanket and another couple came out and we started chatting with them. Um, and they actually offered us a taste of their wine. And it was a really unique wine. It wasn't from Santa Barbara. I think it was from Paso Robles. And it was a wine. I know I'm going off topic, but trust me, it's kind of cool. It was a wine that had been made in like a Solera style. Is that right? What they do with sherry. And basically what had happened was the winemaker kept adding wine to this barrel every year. So it had wine from 2015 and then she added wine from 2016 and 2017 and eventually kind of blended it all together to create this multi-vintage blend. And it was so cool. It was like layered and complex and, and really unique and interesting. I wish I could tell you the name of that winery, but just try to look up like Paso Robles, female winemaker, Solera style wine and, and see what happens. But anyway, we we got to try that just because we were like chilling with these people in the you know, fire pit area and just hanging out. And I feel like it's like, it's a place where fellow wine lovers go and you're likely to have some good connections like that. <laughs> The hotel itself, Hotel Yunez, was in Solvang, California, which, uh, again, I recommend that area. It was, a, it was kind of like a good home base between a lot of different spots. Uh, then there's also the Ballard Inn. This is in, you'll never believe it, Ballard, California, in Santa Barbara. In this boutique hotel, it boasts recently renovated rooms. It's very beautiful, very luxurious. It's kind of like that next step up if you want it to feel a little more romantic, a little bit more special. Go to the Ballard Inn. Now, when should you visit? This podcast is sponsored by Vochill. When you're enjoying a glass of wine, temperature matters. And you don't need to be a wine expert to know this. You know this the minute you realize you forgot to put the bottle of wine in the fridge, and now you're stuck with lukewarm Sauvignon Blanc that is the opposite of refreshing. You know adding ice cubes will just water the wine down, but it seems like it's your only option. Not anymore. I want to introduce you to one of my favorite wine gadgets, Vochill. This gadget is as simple as it is elegant. It will keep wine perfectly chilled in your own wine glass. No more clunky metal or plastic tumblers or ice in your wine. While this gadget is an absolute must during the summer months, I don't enjoy wine without it from June to September. It's also incredibly useful for those days when you're craving a glass of white or rosé, but you don't want to wait for the bottle to chill in the fridge. Vochill offers a stemmed and stemless chiller in multiple colors, so you're bound to find one that's perfect for you. They also make the perfect gift. I should know. I got one for my mom at Christmas a couple years ago, and she loves it. Head to vochill.com, that's V-O-C-H-I-L-L.com, to get your perfect wine chiller, and don't forget to use code CORKANDFIZZ for 15% off your order. This podcast is sponsored by the Cork Crew Virtual Wine Club. Interested in trying new wines, but not sure where to start? Or maybe you've been listening to this podcast for a while and you love the idea of tasting wine live with me. If that's you, come join my Cork Crew Virtual Wine Club and you'll get to sip wine with me twice a month while I help you find new favorite wines. The Cork Crew is not your ordinary wine club. This is a community of people who are passionate about exploring new flavors, learning about different wine styles, and having fun along the way. And the best part about this club? Purchasing the wine is completely optional. Plus, all events are recorded, and you have access to the full library of recordings as a court crew member, so you can always catch up if you can't make it live. Oh, and did I mention it's virtual, which means you get to do all of this from the comfort of your sofa in your PJs. No need to worry about driving in crappy traffic, finding a designated driver, or spending an arm and a leg on a taxi. Want to give it a try without the commitment? You're in luck. Right now, I'm offering a free class pass to anybody who wants to try out the Court Crew Virtual Wine Tasting Club. 
With this pass, you'll be able to join a court crew event of your choosing. No strings attached. I don't need your credit card. I don't need you to sign up for anything. You'll be my guest. Simply head to corkandfizz.com slash free class pass to get your class pass and be one step closer to becoming a member of the best wine tasting club around, the Cork Crew. I can't wait to see you there. Now let's get back to the show. You know, I can't tell you a lot. I think you'd be better off asking somebody who actually lives closer to Santa Barbara. But what I'm going to say is we visited in February. And sure, it was a little chillier. Like, we definitely wore a jacket. I think I wore jeans or a long skirt most of the days. But we had sunshine all weekend. And, like, for those who are used to cooler weather, like us here in Seattle, it was not bad at all. It was way better than whatever Seattle was like in February. Plus, it was not busy. There were never any crowds, so I I thought it was a great time to visit. Otherwise, I will say April also sounds like a really great time to kind of better balance the nice weather and fewer crowds. The more you get into summertime, the more crowds you're going to have and the hotter it's going to get. If you do want to go when the grapes are being harvested, I'd aim for mid-September, early October. It could still be warm, and it will definitely be busier. The wine, the wineries and winemakers themselves will also be busy with harvest, but the vineyards will be gorgeous, and the smell of winemaking will be in the air. I think mid-September, go earlier if you want to see the grapes on the vine. Go later if you want to be somehow part of the winemaking process and maybe get in on trying like a barrel sample or getting to like stomp the grapes or something like that. All right, now for my favorite part of the podcast, we're going to talk about some of my favorite spots. And these, again, these are just like small little handfuls of wineries. I'm sure there are so many more amazing wineries here. These are just the ones that I personally visited and absolutely loved. So I, I want to make sure I can like recommend ones that I've actually had a chance to to visit and taste. So they're in no particular order here. I'm going to tell you later on some of my tips for how to kind of plan your day so that you're not driving all around everywhere and spending half your time in the car. But first, let's just talk about the wineries. Starting off with Totomer, uh, this spot, it is hard to find. <laughs> Their tasting room in like a warehouse setting. It's actually where they make the wine. Um, but trust me, it's worth the effort. You might just have to call them and be like, yo, I feel like I'm in the wrong parking lot. Please help. And they will help. <laughs> they helped us. <laughs> Here at Tomer, they make amazing Gruner Veltliner, Riesling, and Pinot Noir, and of course, Rosé of Pinot Noir. If you go in February, they might actually be working on making the blend for the Rosé. We actually got to taste two different versions and give our opinions on which one we liked the most. That was pretty cool. Uh, the winemaker here at Tomer spent some time in Austria, hence the love for Gruner Veltliner. He also says that, you know, the sites that excite him the most are the cooler ones, which is why he landed in Santa Barbara. He really likes the lighter weight, nuanced flavors, bracing acidity. And to him, Riesling is the ultimate grape to pursue those types of characteristics. He thinks no other grape conveys its region's character and the varietal flavor quite like Riesling. So he actually started Totomer making Riesling, then brought in his love for Gruner Vettliner from the time in Austria. And then, of course, Santa Barbara makes great Pinot Noir. How could he not do that? The tasting experience itself, really informative. We didn't taste with the winemaker, but we tasted with, he was either the assistant winemaker or like he was like lead in the tasting room and like he knew his stuff. When we asked questions about it, he was answering for us. And then, like I said, we happened to be there when the winemaker was testing out some rosés. And so we got to taste those, which is kind of cool. It's very specialized, very intimate. And we actually became wine club members after our tasting. And it was the uh, the very first spot we visited. And I say that because like you'd think we'd be like very cautious of joining right away. Because you're like, oh, you're going to you're going to join too many if you do this. It was so good. We couldn't say no. And uh, I think we also ended up getting like an older bottle of Riesling because they had a few of them um, laying around. And they're like, hey, we're like giving these out for like it's like only like thirty five dollars, like the cost of like a regular one. It's like a. 12 year old Riesling. And I'm like, uh, yes, please. We'll, we'll take that. <laughs> okay. Moving on to another spot. Let's talk about story of soil. The winemaker here, Jessica Gasca knows what she is doing. This is a very small winery, but they make excellent Pinot Noir among other things as well. But Ooh, I remember the Pinot Noir. It was just, it was stupid good. <laughs> we, um, we had actually booked a private winery tasting and tour, for our trip, but they got their dates mixed up and the day we were visiting was their big members release party. So they invited us to that. We ended up getting to taste all of their new releases and we were very, very impressed. So I definitely love to go back and talk to Jessica more and get to learn about her style and how she makes things. 
but it was pretty cool to get to try all of the wines without actually having to be a member. Uh, next up is Final Girl Wine. So this winery, I've actually had the winemaker here on the podcast, Anna, before. They actually borrow space from Story of Soil and store a lot of their stuff there. They don't actually have a tasting room yet. So if you want to taste with them, reach out to them via email or Instagram to schedule a tasting. Um, they basically just like brought some of their wine in a cooler and we sat out on the picnic tables out by Story of Soil, which was kind of fun. Uh, like I said, husband and wife team, we've talked to Anna on the podcast before. Go back and listen to that podcast to learn more. I love all their wines. We are a wine club member with Final Girl, but I especially appreciate the Chenin Blanc and the orange wines, plus all their fun sparkling wines. Next up, let's talk about Beckman. Beckman, it's B-E-C-K-M-E-N. I was actually invited to go here by the owners of a wine club that we used to be a part of. I still highly recommend it. It's kind of one of those things where we just kind of cycle through. I say we, my partner and I, um, we cycle through wine clubs because you always want to be a part of them, but you can't be a part of too many because then you end up with so much wine. So my thing is we just kind of cycle through and, and we'll leave one and try another one and then we might come back to it later. Um, and it's nothing against the the club itself. We usually love the wine. Um, we just always like to try new things. So anyway, this wine club, it's called Revisit Wine Co. I highly recommend checking it out if you want to learn more about Santa Barbara. They're actually ones that got me into Santa Barbara wine because they highlight small producers across Santa Barbara. And it made me realize like how good California wine could really be. I mean, I had a little bit of a thing against it because of the expensive like Napa Cabernets and stuff like that. But then I started trying this. I'm like, oh, well, that's good. So anyway, uh, we are wine club members with them. And so they invited us to Beckman where they are a wine club member. So we got a free tasting, but it was, it was really lovely to visit. It was beautiful views. Again, it's just like, I, you're going to hear me say it a lot, but that's the thing. I could just go there to see the views and drink the wine. They also told us the story here at Beckman of how they turned one of their failing vineyards. They had this one vineyard that never produced good grapes and they just couldn't figure out what it was and they are ready to just do away with it and have to go somewhere else, which was going to cost a lot of money. And they're like, you know what? Let's just try this thing. I've, I've read this thing about biodynamics. Let's grow the grapevines biodynamically. And it was just like a, a 180. Like it completely turned it around and they had absolutely amazing fruit. So they are now dedicated to farming all of their vineyards biodynamically, not because it's a trend, but because they have seen the results and the power of farming biodynamically. Okay, moving on. I think I have four more wineries to talk about. Next one is called Presquil. I think I'm saying that right. It is P-R-E-S-Q-U apostrophe I-L-E. Maybe it's Presquile. That sounds funny too. <laughs> Here, this is one of those that like you feel like royalty walking into the tasting room because it is so beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's got views overlooking the hills and mountains, these big windows. I recommend when we went, we did what was called the picnic experience. I think they now just call it the wine and food experience. It is a little costly. I think when I last looked it up, it was like $70 a person, but it is so worth it. And it's a meal. Don't worry. You do not need to plan like to have a meal uh, after this. It's where the chef brings in fresh and seasonal flavors into these dishes and they pair with your tasting and in such a beautiful way it was and it's like kind of like I think six or seven different little dishes that you get to try and I think you can do it with two to six people but it was super fun I, I highly recommend next up another one which was beautiful Demetria Estate so this is D-E-M-E-T-R-I-A maybe it's Demetria Estate and holy crap, <laughs> like my jaw dropped when we drove in through the gates of this estate. Like it feels like you are transported to the French countryside. Like we were a little worried. Remember we rented the Tesla? <laughs> like we were worried the Tesla wouldn't make it on the dirt roads, but we're good. We were good. It was worth it. The wine was delicious, but I 100% recommend going to this winery, Dimitri Estate, Yearly for the ambiance alone. Like if you want beautiful photos or you want to feel like you're truly in a vineyard away from everyone in the rest of the world, go here. Couldn't recommend enough. Okay, last two. Let's talk about Mardrum. This is a winery. They've got a really talented, friendly winemaker. His name is Doug Mardrum. He's been involved in the Santa Barbara food and wine scene for over 35 years. Funny enough, it must have been like wine release club weekend because We'd also signed up for an experience at Marjum, and then they said, hey, we're also having a party that day. Feel free to come early and come taste some of the wine. So we did. Of course we did. 
Um, we got to try some of their aged wines, some new ones that are coming out. And then while we were kind of chilling, waiting for our experience to start, we started talking to this guy that was in this area. He seemed like he was just like somebody that worked at the winery. Turns out it was Doug Marjoram and uh, we didn't even know it. So super friendly, easy to talk to guy. Um, we actually did their white roan blending experience. And this is where we got to blend our own white wine from lots of different roan style varieties. They had actually called us to confirm that we meant white and not red because this was the first one they'd ever done as the white blending experience. Everybody always chose the red. Looking on the website, I can't find this blending experience, but you know what? You might as well just ask if you're planning to go to Santa Barbara. Just just see if they do it. They might still do it. They just don't put it on the website. Also, I could have sworn there was a connection between their core blend. So at Marjoram, their blend, they call them M5. I could have sworn that like Maroon 5, there was a connection there. Like Maroon 5 had them at their wedding or had them at something special. I can't find it online. So you're going to have to ask about that while you're there tasting. Okay, last winery I'm going to recommend is called Brick Barn. This was a larger winery, lots of options for different styles of wine. It's kind of one of those if you have like a large group and you want to have a table big enough for everybody, you want to have a lot of different options, go to Brick Barn. The winery is right by some vineyards and views of the mountains. Again, beautiful. I know you're sick of me saying it. (laughs) They often have live music and they also have a really good sparkling wine. All right, super quick here. Let's talk food and restaurants. So like I said, great, great food. I'm going to highlight all the places that we went to. And I think I have one or two on here that we weren't able to make it to, but I still I still recommend. So first up, Roblar Winery and Vineyard. Now, technically, this is a winery, but I highly recommend visiting for brunch. We went there on the day that we were flying out. Oh, my goodness. Like, it was so delicious. It's going to be kind of American food, probably like mid-priced. Then you have Bar Le Cote. This is in Los Olivos, and this is seafood, and they have a seafood tower on the menu that you can customize with whatever you want to put in the seafood tower. Like, need I say more? It was it was a special experience. It's definitely higher price. I'm going to put this at the higher price of all the restaurants that we're talking about, but so, so worth it. So good. That one's Bar La Cote. Then we have S-Y Kitchen. That's like the letters S and the letter Y, Kitchen. This is in San Ynez. It is Italian food. And honestly, it had like the most romantic vibes. Great Italian food. Lots of variety as well. And it's both family friendly and like a good place to go as a date. So highly recommend that spot. There's also Industrial Eats in Buellton. This is a must stop lunch or dinner. I think we stopped for lunch. I will warn you to expect a wait. I think we went even late for lunch. Like it was 1.30 or 2 and it was still like packed. I think we waited about an hour for our food and there's like not a ton of like there's a lot of seating, but it's really busy. But it was it was really delicious. Like I had it starred on my on my agenda. So like I know I liked it. Another spot, a good spot for breakfast, because listen, you always got to have a good breakfast when you're going to go out wine tasting. It's called Bob Swell Bread. It might be Bob's Swell Bread. Either way, just look it up, Bob Swell Bread. You'll find it. Um, They have a spot in Los Alamos, Los Alamos, and Ballard. Came highly recommended. I think I ended up doing something different, but one of the gals I talked to with recommendations for this area said you have to try the egg in a jar and also to go early because it will also get very busy. One place we didn't go to but came highly recommended is called The Hitching Post. This is your dinner if you want to try Santa Maria-style barbecue, and it's in Buellton. Okay, last little thing I'm going to talk about before we end this podcast. When you are planning your trip, here is my top tip. I think I talk about this in my tips for planning wine travel, but especially for Santa Barbara. What I want you to do is I want to make want you to make a list of all the places that you want to go to, and then I want you to put those on a map. And one of the best ways to do this is use Google Maps. When you look up each of the places, save them and make a custom list. You can make a you can make a list on Google. You just go into the save. It's like a little, it looks like the save button on Instagram. It looks like a little bookmark almost. You hit that button and then it gives you an option to just save it to like a regular list like favorites or you make a new one. You call it Santa Barbara. You save all the places that you want to go to. You also save your hotel so you can say where that is. Then you open up that list and you can see where everything is and you can create your itinerary based on where places are and how to drive between them. 
Normally, I would say all you need to do is just look at the map and see that. Santa Barbara in particular, I would also check navigation because the thing is some places might seem close together, but the roads are a limiting factor and you might have to like travel back a little ways and get back on one of the main highways to then go down another dirt road, even though it looks like the two wineries are right next to each other. So for example, I'm going to share with you what my itinerary was on the, the first day that we were in Santa Barbara. So like I said, we stayed at Hotel Yanez, which is in Solvang. So we started with breakfast at Bob's Wellbred in Ballard. That was at 8.45 a.m. And I had a note to leave at 9.45 a.m. because the first winery that we were going to was probably the longest drive from Solvang, but I really wanted to go. It's called Totomer Wines. That was the very first one that I talked about. I had booked a 60-minute cellar tasting with them. And the thing was, it was a long drive, but... There was another winery up there that I could try pretty close by. So what we could do is we went up to Totomer, did the tasting, and then we traveled. It was only like, I think, a 10-minute drive from Totomer to Presquil. And so we did the winery picnic there. It was right around lunchtime, so it worked out really well. Then we drove back to Solvang. We hung out at the hotel. I think we explored downtown a little bit, kind of left ourselves some free time. Then in the afternoon... We stuck close to the hotel, so we did uh, the Beckman tasting with our friends Mary from Revisit Wine Co., and that was really close by. I think it was like a 10-minute drive, if that, and then we did dinner at SY Kitchen, which again was under a 10-minute drive from both the winery and our hotel. So the way we did that, like on our first day, we said, okay, we're going to do the big drive up in the morning, go to two wineries in that area, then come back down to our area where we were staying at the hotel and kind of stick around there. That way, you know, imagine if we had done Totomer and Pesquil, but on two different days, we would have had to done that same drive two days in a row. Like that would not have been fun. So like I said, look at them on a map. If you want help with planning this trip, send me a message. This is a new service that I'm going to start providing because I've had the experience doing it. And you don't have to go to the same wineries that I went to. I will help you find ones that fit for you, but I'll use my expertise and my experience and building these trips so that I'll put together an entire itinerary for you and you just have to follow it and even help you make all the reservations and everything you need. So just send me a message um, on Instagram at Cork and Fizz or send me an email Haley at Cork and Fizz if you are interested in that. I can do it for any area that I've visited before. I could also try it for areas that I haven't visited, but it won't be as, <laughs> as good since I don't have the experience. Okay, I think that's enough talking for today, isn't it? I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. I also want to give a quick shout out to Heather at Craft and Cluster. She is one who shared so many recommendations with me when I was heading to Santa Barbara, and I'm sure many of them showed up in this podcast, so I want to give her a shout out. She does photography and media for wineries in the Santa Barbara area, so go give her a follow. If you love this episode as much as I did, so appreciate it. Just take a quick second, rate it, leave a review. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. I release new episodes every Wednesday. In next week's episode, I'll be sharing all my top tips for hosting your own wine tasting party at home. Thanks again for listening. And don't forget, if you like to taste wine live with me and belong to a community of amazing fellow wine lovers, come join my court crew. Head to corkandfizz.com slash free class pass to come check out a tasting for free. Cheers.